Okay, hello. We're just waiting for a few more. Or not. Hello, just gonna give everybody another minute or so to come in and then I will begin. I don't know what happened to everybody today. Yeah, I, the, I think that the late night and just the rain and everything is probably push everybody, keeping everybody away at the moment. It's hard to get home from work. Oh, could be, yeah. Okay, so I'll start and when others come, then they can join. So I am intending for this week, and if we don't finish this week, for next week to be going over some of the development of the halacha for Shabbat, or Shabbat, sorry, for Hanukkah, since it's coming up and we're about to about ready to get into everything of Hanukkah. So why not learn just where some of the halacha of Hanukkah really come from? So. The, the first mention of Hanukkah in our text is not in the Bible itself, not in the Tanakh, but rather it is mentioned very briefly in the Mishnah and the Gemara. So the first question really that the Gemara asks about it is, what is Hanukkah? Because, or, because well, the, well, the Gemara knows that we celebrate Hanukkah since it's not talked about in the Torah or in any of the prophets or writings, it is a question of what is it that we are actually celebrating? So the Gemara asks and answers, what is Hanukkah and why are lights kindled on Hanukkah? And the Gemara answers, the sages taught in the in Megillah Tamit, on the 25th day of Kislev, the, di the days of Hanukkah are eight, one may not eulogize on them, and one may not fast on them. What is the reason? When the Greeks entered the sanctuary, they defiled all the oils that were in the sanctuary by touching them. And when the Hasmonean monarchy overcame them and emerged victorious over them, they searched and found only one cruise of oil that was placed with a seal of a high priest, undisturbed by the Greeks. And there was sufficient oil in there, uh, there to light the candelabra for one, for only one day. A miracle occurred, and they lit the candelabra for, for for eight days. The next year, the sages instituted these days, uh, instituted those days, and made them holidays and presiding. Hollow and thanks, special thanksgiving and prayers and blessings. So the very first the very first mention of Hanukkah is is that which is found in the Gemara in Sakam Shabbos. And it talks and it talks all about the miracle that happened with the oil with the oil. So this is the this is really our first traditional source for Hanukkah in the text. So now comes the rules that come about with Hanukkah. So the first 
question that really must be dealt with is where does one light the menorah? Since the since everything that we talk about for Hanukkah has to do with the recognition of the miracle, the miracles and the oil, therefore all of our all of our learning is going to be focused on the menorah itself. So the the first question is where do we light the menorah and the and the Gemara teaches sages taught in a Breita, it is a mitzvah to place the Hanukkah candles at the entrance to one's house on the outside. So that's the very first thing that's the very first thing that we see is that the Gemara says that one should take their menorah and put it outside. So on this two of the major two of the major commentators on the Gemara Rashi and Tosfot have a disagreement of what exactly they mean by outside. Rashi is of the opinion that on the outside means right outside of one's house. On the outside, for the sake of publicizing the miracle, but the candle should not be placed in the public domain, but rather in its courtyard for the house, for the house is opened into a courtyard. So Rashi says that you would have a series of houses around a courtyard, sort of like houses around a cul-de-sac, and you would take your menorah and you would put it outside in the courtyard, but and outside of your house. Tosla gives a different answer and says, and it refers to a case where there is no courtyard, rather the house directly faces the public domain. However, if there is a courtyard in front of the house, it is a mitzvah to place it at the entrance of the courtyard so that it's in the street itself, so that people could see the people can see the menorah. Now this seems like a very min an argument over minutia, but really what the argument is, is a discussion of what is it that we are trying to accomplish with menorah. Tosfo says that our goal is to publicize to the world that a miracle happened for us and make it known throughout the world. Rashi says, well, it is important to publicize it. The most important people that have to know about it are the people who are in your house has to be connected to the house. So even if you have a courtyard, shouldn't take it out, shouldn't take it too far away from your household. So these are the two opinions that we see and both opinions have their, have, have their basis. But at the end of the day, we have to know what to do. And so comes the Shulchan Aruch, comes the, comes the codified rule of rulings and he rules like the Tosfos. One should place the Hanukkah candles at the entrance adjacent to the public domain on the outside of the house. If the house opens to the public domain, he should place it at the entrance. If there's a courtyard in front of the house, he should place it at the entrance of the courtyard. So even so between the disagreement between Rashi and Tosfot, the Shulchan Aruch says that the halacha, that the law follows the opinion of the Tosfot. So this is the codified law as of the 1500s, but we have we have many different situations nowadays. We don't live in houses with court, courtyards per se, but rather we live in in houses that are on streets or we live in apartment buildings. So our modern day our modern day halacha still has to deal with what we should do. So in that regard, we have a we have a book called the Peske Chuba, which is a collection of halachic opinions from the time of the Shulchan Aruch until modern period. And the Piskei Tshuva is gonna cite the Rabbi Hazan Ish, who was a major authority in the city of Bnei Brak in Eretz Israel in the, in the 1930s, 20s and 1930s. And he cites the, his opinion on how to under, on what we should do in modern times. He says, it is brought, that, brought in the name of the Hazan Ish that in our times, a courtyard is only used as a thoroughfare or as a garden, it's there. It is not used, not used for household purposes as in the times of the sages. And if one lay at the entrance to a courtyard, it would not be noticeable or, or publicize the miracle to the household. Therefore, one must lay at the entrance of the house into the courtyard. But it was taught in the name of the Grez of Brisk, Rabbi Yitzhak Zev Soloveitchik, that even in today's times, one should light at the entrance of a courtyard that faces the public domain. Nevertheless, even according to the Chazan Ish, one should not light at the entrance of the house unless the candles can still be, can still be seen by a passerby of the street. But if the yard is completely concealed on all sides and the passerby cannot see into it at all, 
1,080 degrees that one should not light at the entrance of his house, but rather the window that faces the public domain. So a lot of information here, but the thing to note is that both the opinion of the Grizz of Brisk, Rapsolovich, and the Chazonish is that we should ha we have to follow at least the letter of the Shulchan Aruch that the most important factor is that the people outside of the house, the people on the street need to be able to see the, the menorah. That is the, that is the main thrust. So just, to, just to finish this off, we see, whereas the Chazanich was the major decider for the 1920s and 1930s, Rav Shomazan Arba was another great name in, uh, in halakhic authority in Eretz Israel, and he is going to cite, he's going to argue with the opinion of the Chazanish, more like the opinion of the Grizz, and say, similarly, Rav Shomazan Arba held that there is no distinction between the courtyards in the days of the Gemara and the yards of today with regards to the laws of Hanukkah. This is also the opinion of Rav Eliashev. In his opinion, even a garden in front of one's house has the status of a courtyard, and one must light at the entrance to it. So these are the these were the opinions as as given mostly in Eretz Yisrael that of how one should light the menorah on the outside on the outside of your house, visible to to the street. Okay, so a question arises: What about apartment buildings? Because apartment buildings, if you lit it outside of your door, you're not really going to be showing it to the street. You're going to be showing it to the inside of the apartment building. Furthermore, there is a there is another issue of in the apartment buildings that we have an upper limit of how high you are allowed to light your menorah. The unit given in the Gemara is tw twenty amot, which quick conversion. I think is approximately 30 meters. And so that's going to be a question also for apartment buildings. So to start, we go back into the Gemara in Shabbat, which states, if he lives upstairs, he places it at the window adjacent to the public domain. So we saw this mentioned in the Chazan Ish, and we'll see it, we'll see it mentioned a few times, a few more times that there is an idea of placing it in a window such that it faces towards the street so that the people who are eight passing by will be able to see it. This is, this is a major idea that's gonna come up many places, but it's not so clear if this always is going to apply or only if one doesn't have access to putting it outside of their, of their house. Usually we talk of usually one of our bottom line sources that we're gonna that we come back to over and over again is the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch itself was not meant to be the go-to book of Jewish law. When when it was written, Rabbi Yosef Cairo wrote it as a means of summarizing his point, his points that he made in a larger book. There was a book called the Arbatory, which was an older codifi codification of Jewish law. And on that, there were many com commentaries. One of the most famous ones was the Beit Yosef, the, com the commentary of Rav, Rav Yosef Cairo. It, after finishing that commentary, he took, the, he took the cliff notes, per se, of his Beit Yosef, and condensed it into what we now call the Shulchan Aruch. So oftentimes when there is a halacha that is difficult to understand in the Shulchan Aruch, usually the explanation will be found in the Beit Yosef, where he explains much further why he, why he rules the way he does in any particular halacha. So in the Beit Yosef, Rav Cairo says, here is reference here it refers to an attic upstairs that has an entrance into the bottom floor of the house. So that if one place it, placed it, the candle at the entrance of the house downstairs or at the entrance of the attic, it might not be recognizable that it is for the attic. Therefore, one places it at the window facing the public domain. So this is to say that one should, 
the only reason that we place it in the window is because if you were to place it at your entrance, it would be inside, it would be in the building, and you wouldn't be able to know that this is something special for the attic. Um, ah. Okay, um, so I am happy to, I am happy to share th this document. I can, I can try and figure out how to send it into, into the chat. Um, so the, as, as for the source of the, as for the question about the source for the miracle of the oil, there are two primary sources for that. One being the Gemara and one being something called Megillat Tanit or the scroll of fast. Megillat Tanit is mostly non-existent at this time. We have been able to piece together parts of it, but we don't have it in full. The other source for the, the rest of the Hanukkah story as we know it is, is from the Sefer, Sefer Maccabee. It is not part of our canon. It is part of what is called the Apocrypha. Mostly it's been preserved in Christian scripture, actually. But there is, but it is used as, as a historical proof for most of the war that happened. The miracle of the oil is not actually mentioned in the so, inside of Sefer, Sefer Maccabee. So we have no proof of it at all. Um, of the so, era, of, or, during the time that it was allegedly happening. So no, Se Sefer, Tan Sefer Tani and Sefer and the Book of the Maccabees both are both come approximately a hundred years later, and they contain differing accounts. As for why why one doesn't include it and one does, there is much commentary on that from the from the crit critical to the to the Hasidic to the to the Kabbalistic, there are many different people have different reasons why why the Gemara doesn't include anything about the war and Sefer Maccabee doesn't include anything about the miracle. So what about, about Sefer Tani? Does it have anything about the oil? Yes. Sefer, so actually, the we have reference in the Gemara is a sm, is a smaller quote from Sefer Tani, which goes into more detail about. The, yeah, the events of the Gemara. But the Gemara is, is, is many years after. The Talmud is many years after. I'm talking right, from, from it, the era. So Sefer Tanit is contemporary to the era? Um, Sefer Tanit is, is a little bit prior to the, Mishnai, to the Mishnah itself. So it's about three or four hundred years prior to the Gemara. And the Gemara is quoting Sefer Tanit when it brings its, its, uh, when it brings its story. So Sefer Tani talks about the miracle of the oil. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's such an important factor, which the whole holiday was born out of it, and there's not one word in Sefer Maccabee. It's peculiar. Right. So uh, for a short answer for why that would be, there is actually no, there's actually no halachic significance to the fact that they lit with pure oil. The the commentators and all of the halakhic authorities agree that in a place where you cannot find any oil that is pure, it is halakhically permissible to use impure oil. The entire war of the, Maca the Maccabees was that they wanted to show the, how, how purity over, overpowers impurity and how righteousness overpowers a lack of righteousness so for the purposes of showing that, that to the world, they sought out specifically, specifically to have pure oil. And because they were so emphatic about how purity should be preserved in the world over all else, Hashem rewards them with a miracle that doesn't need to exist, but exists anyway, exists anyways, that they should find this pure oil, even though it's not halakh halakhically a necessity for them. And yet there's not a word of it in Sefer Maccabee. That is true, yes. So how do we know it actually happened? 
So again, this is this is a question more along the lines of there are the there are historians who want to say that the who want to say that the story of the oil is a metaphor for the Mac the Maccabi the Maccabees own victory in the war, a small a small and significant people that couldn't survive managed to outlast the Greek army. Metaphorically shown by a small pack of oil that couldn't have lasted for eight days, lasting for eight days. There are those who want to say that the that the the Maccabees weren't that many miracles happened during during the war. That the fact that we even that they survived at all is itself is a miracle. Mm -hmm. The pack of oil was at that point significant to all the to all the goings on of the Maccabees and the war and the effort to reconquer the land that com comes after. Because there's eight, there's four books of Mac four books in Sefer Mac Maccabee, and it is trying to it is trying to show us the entire extent from the time that the Greeks come in up until the the Hasmonean dynasty really takes a solid hold over more land than that Jews had controlled since the since before the kingdom had split with David and Shlomo. Mm -hmm. So they weren't so concerned as much with the mir the miracles as the political landscape. So there's many different answers I could give as to why it's not contained within, but I can't give you the answer because that's still a debate amongst scholars and and historians and religious leaders of all types. Thank you. Back to back to the halacha of it, we see that the shul, the shulchan Ayah, or that the Beit Yosef at least cites that the idea of lighting in a window is only when it wouldn't be recognizable that the person who's lighting is is lighting for themselves. So again, we're going to look into the piske chuvos to see the opinions of the, the opinion of the chazanish, and it's and it says here. There's room for discussion regarding apartment buildings in our time as to what the status of the stairwell is. On the one hand, this is better than the case of the Gemara of one who lives upstairs for the stairwell is similar to a common courtyard for, the, for all the tenants of the building and therefore the entrance uh, to the stairwell can be called an entrance to the courtyard. On the other hand, at the entrance to the stairwell is not recognizable which candle belongs to which apartment. According to the Chazanish, it's clear that one cannot light at the entrance to the stairwell. The entrance of the courtyard, nor the, nor the entrance to one's house, since no one outside will see it. Rather, one should light on one's house, house by the window that faces the public domain. If one can light by the doorway of the balcony that faces the public domain, it is even better. So, the cousin each says explicitly that one should light in the window, even in our modern day apartment. But the the rest of the the, the rest of the uh, halakhic decisors who disagreed with the cousin each as to the status of what is and is not considered a courtyard are going to be are going to be up in the air about what exactly the stairway considered if it is considered a courtyard in and of itself we should put the we should put them at the put the menorahs at the entrance of the stairwell but if the stairway is considered like the public domain because people can come up and down the stairway at any, any time and there's permission for anybody to be there then should be right outside of the right outside of the door. So that's the three opinions of what to do in a stairwell. And see how Ravavadia Yosef, who is the major Sephardi po posik, ruled in this. And he says, one who lives in an upstairs apartment, one should perform the mitzvah by lighting the conic candles by the window or on the balcony facing the public domain in order to fulfill the imperative of publicizing the miracle. Magin Abraham and the other Akronim, this is, this is even if the window is higher than the 10th Tfachim from the floor of the apartment. It's best to place the candles in a glass box and place it on the balcony in order that it be seen by passerby in the public domain. So Rav, Rav Vadia says that for the for people living in the in apartment buildings, it is still better, like the Chazanish says, to put it in the window. This is following the simple reading of the Beit, the Shulchan Aruch and the Beit Yosef, 
And Rav Avadia Yosef always tried to stay as close to the Shulchan Aruch and the Beis Yosef as possible. Now, most of these questions are much more pertinent to the Sephardim. As Ashkenazim, there is a very common minhag at this point of lighting inside. As we saw, the Gemara stated explicitly that one should light their Hanukkiah in, uh, outside of their apartment, close to the public domain. But it says further, and in times of, time of danger, when the Gentiles issue a decree of pro, to prohibit kindling light, he may place it on the table, and this is sufficient to fulfill his obligation. So the, the Gemara already has an exception that allows for lighting inside when it is dangerous to light outside. This is quoted by the tour, which I mentioned before, but I will say again, the tour is one of the early codified works of Halakha, and it is the tour that the that Rav Yosef Cairo wrote his Beit Yosef on, and that is the basis for our Shulchan Aruch. So the tour writes, and danger where one is not allowed to fill the mitzvah, one places it on the table, and this is sufficient. So we see this idea that Rashi had already mentioned at the beginning of our of our study that there is an idea that lighting should be also for the people inside the house. We see that when it's dangerous and one cannot light outside of the house, the next step is that at least for the people inside the house, the candles should be lit. So there is a few more opinion amongst the Rishonim, the medieval scholars of when exactly does this apply? We will look at the Shibuya Lechet and the Orza Ruach to see a Machloket that will continue through the, through the Shulchan Aruch. The Orza Ruach is the first opinion and says, in times of danger where the, where the Persian law was that it was forbidden to light candles on the days of the, their idolatrous festivals, anywhere other than in the house of idolatry. In such a case, one lights on one's table, and this is, that is sufficient. Some commentaries explain that the time of danger refers to where the de they decreed that Hanukkah candles may not be lit. But in our time, where there is no danger, I do not know the reason why we do not light in the courtyard. So the Ors of Ruach says pretty blank, point blank, that there is, that when there's no danger, there is an obligation to light outside is Sefer And he says, in times of danger, one places the candles on one's table, and that is sufficient. The Baha Dibra wrote that after they become accustomed to light, to light inside, during the times of danger, they continue this custom. But one who can place it outside should place it outside, and if not, one places it on his table. So the Shibuya Lechet uses less harsh terms about those who are continuing to light inside and says that that once they became, it became the custom, that's the custom. And even though it's better to light outside, it's permissible to light inside. So these are our two opinions. This comes down, comes out in halacha as if one lives in an upper floor and does not have an open entranceway to the public domain, he places it in the window next to the public domain. And in a time of danger, when one is not allowed to fulfill the mitzvah, he places it on the table and this is sufficient. So no mention of an idea of put, keeping it inside anywhere else. Um, Shul the Shulchan Aruch continues. The mitzvah is to place the Hanukkah candles within the handbreadth closest to the entrance to the, on the left. So the mezuzah is on the right, the Hanukkah candles on the left. But if there is no mezuzah on the entrance, one should place it on the right. And now here comes the Ramah to say what the, what the minhag in the, in the Ashkenazi world was. But nowadays, when we all light inside, there is no distinction for people in the public domain at all. One should not worry too much if one does not light the, in a handbreadth closest to the entrance. In any case, the custom is to light in a handbreadth closest to the entrance, like in our, our ancestors' days, and one should not deviate unless there are too many members of the house, household members, in which case it's preferable for everyone to light in a separate place rather than mixing the lights together with no distinction of the numbers of lights that they are kindling. So we see that the Shulchan, the Shulchan Aruch mentions nothing about lighting inside other than in a time of danger. And the Ramah, following the Shibuya Lachet, says 
that we're accustomed to lighting inside. So, so that's what we do, and it's okay. So, the Mishnah Brewer, who is also the Chofetz Chaim, uh, Rav Simcha Mer, I don't remember his last name, shoot, um, right, that he, he is one of the most authoritative of the Akronim, the later state, the, the latest generation of sages. And he, he is considered one of the most authoritative in matters of the, in matters of the holidays. And he says, and one should not deviate. Nevertheless, if one has a window that faces the public, public domain, it is more correct to light there in order to be notice, noticeable by the passerby in the public domain. And the miracle will be publicized unless it is a place where damage is likely to be, to be caused due to this. So he says, that, he says that even if we're lighting inside, it is still preferable to place it near the window over placing it by the door so that it's noticeable to, to the people who are walking in the street. A final word in this whole discussion will be Rav Moshe Feinstein, from who was the who was the possibly greatest authority in American Judaism. At least I don't know if he had that same clout in Canada, but in American Judaism he was considered one of the greatest uh, halachic decisors of the last generation. And he says they only instituted that one place the candles at the entrance to one's house on the outside in order to publicize the miracle, which is the major, the major objective of Hanukkah candles. And the discussion of whether to place it on the right, which is the side of the, side of the mezuzah, or the left, uh, this was only the case where this is the was the only case where the Amoraim disagreed. And the halacha is according to a shmuel that he placed on the left in order that the Hanukkah candles be on the left and the mezuzah on the right, so that the end that one enters in between two mitzvot. But this was this was not the main reason for the institution. So what he's saying here is that this idea of which side the Hanukkah was sitting is, is all about when the, the Hanukkah lights are kept outside of the house, when they are kept by the door. But when they are not kept outside, then a different, different thing takes priority, the idea of public, publicizing miracle. So he's going to say, therefore, the Megain of Ram correctly states that if one has a window facing the public domain, one should place it there. The, the Vush explains his reasoning that publicizing the miracle is preferred over the reason of entering between two mitzvot. According to what we have written, this is clear. Therefore, even though in today's times, the main recognition is for the people of the household, since we cannot light outside, nevertheless, what can be done for the greater publicizing of the miracle should be done. And this is how I am accustomed to doing, lighting the candle in the window where it can be seen by passerby. So we have Sir Moshe living in, uh, the Lower East Side of New York, where there were apartment buildings and one could not necessarily light in the hallways, said, said better to light in the window than by the door so that anybody who was walking by could look up and see the menorah at least sitting in the window. And that, I think, is the major custom in America. I would imagine with how rainy it is here, that is probably also a prevalent custom in Vancouver. So him, though I will say in Eretz Israel, the custom is still to try and light outdoors every night if possible. So this we see really the, we see the American community following Rabbi Moshe and the Israeli community following the Chazan Ish and Shomad Alman Arbach, which in other halakhos that we will discuss over the course of our learning together, we'll see is a very common trend where communities tend to follow their major decisors. Okay, so that is going to be that is going to be everything about where exactly to place it. We have one major question left, and that is lighting too high. All of the apartment buildings that we have been discussing, it is nice to talk about the idea of somebody lighting in the window and passersby seeing them and, know, and knowing it's Hanukkah. 
But if a building is too high, then you start losing the chance of anybody actually seeing the candle sitting in the window. And the Gemara was very aware of this, and they kept put a maximum height on how high you could build, you could light your Hanukkah, Hanukkah candles. And the and the Gemara in the second Shabbos says Hanukkah candles that were placed higher than twenty amot are invalid. One cannot light the Hanukkah lights above twenty amot, which I am still going with approximately thirty meters. So this is codified in the Shulchan Aruch as one should place the Hanukkah candles above three handbreadths from the ground and is a mitzvah to place it beneath 10 handbreadths. But if you place it above 10 handbreadths, he has fulfilled his obligation. However, if you place it above 20 cubits, he's not fulfilled his obligation. That is the opinion of the Shulchan Aruch and the Ramah adds, and even if he took it, took it this way, above 20 cubits while it was lit and placed it below 20 cubits, he has not fulfilled his obligation but because the lighting accomplishes the mitzvah. So the Ramah adds an addendum here to say that even if one were to light it above 20, 20, 20 cubits and then take it down lower, that doesn't work because it has to be that it is lit in a proper way to fulfill the mitzvah. If one, if one didn't lit it and it wasn't proper, there wasn't enough oil, it was too high, a plethora of other reasons why it might be improper, then it then even though though you fix the fixed it later, that doesn't fix the problem. Okay, so we are going to look at one of the commentators on the Shulchan Aruch who says the Sharetzion who comments, but if the window was higher than the than the ground of the public domain by twenty amot, it is not noticeable to the passerby of the public domain. Then it is better to place it at the entrance of the house than the window. So. That discussion that we saw with Rav Moshe and the Chazanish and all the other opinions that we're talking about whether or not to place it in the window or place it outside by the door, all this is, says the sharp Sh tune, is only if the window is below a certain height. But if it's too high that people walking in the street won't notice it, then it's, then it's no good. So that sounds like a pretty straightforward Halacha, but we're gonna we're gonna make it we're gonna make it a little bit more complicated. We're gonna quote the Piske Chuba, who's gonna quote quite a few other opinions. One who lives in a multi multiple story building and his apartment is above twenty amot, the chart Tian writes that one should put, should not place candles in the window facing the public domain, since this will not be noticeable to the people there, since the eye does not see above twenty amot. Rather, one should place it opposite the mezuzah, but some have written that if there are other multiple story buildings in the city, then the neighbors who live in the upper floors will see it even above 20 amo, and therefore it is preferable to light in the windows. Others argue and write to the sages only institute publicizing the miracle of the passerby in the street, therefore once you light at the entrance to one's house to, or below at the entrance to the stairwell. So as we see, all of the opinions are, quote, are quoted for us here in the chart in the piece Kichuva. I am not going to give any particular stock on this, but we see already that everything that we've seen, everything that comes down from the from the Rishonim and the Achronim, that are medieval and post post medieval scholars, is brought to a head in our modern day, where the where we have the options of what to do with the Aaronic light about the placing. The other question that we have is the time for lighting candles. So the time, the time for lighting candles is pretty straightforward in the, in the Gemara. The Gemara Shabbos says, the mitzvah is from when the sun sets until there is no one left in the market, marketplace. Straightforward. The, the key issue with menorah is always about publicizing the miracle, and therefore, when nobody is in the marketplace, there is no one passing by to see the passing by to see the candlelight, and therefore, there is no mitzvah of Hanukkah. So, of course, something so straightforward, we're going to see lots of different opinions of how to understand this. The Tosfot, the who is the commentator who that is 
from the school of Rashi, but almost always disagrees with Rashi, quotes an opinion from the Riporat. And it says, the Riporat says that one should be careful to light at night immediately so that it should not become too late, following the simple reading of the, of the Gemara. The run, on the other hand, see, goes with a different understanding. The mitzvah is from when the sun sets. This is not to say that one cannot light before this time, for Shabbat proves that that is incorrect, since one has to light before the sun sets, where Rabbi states that from when the sun sets, it is considered twilight and Shabbat has begun. Rather, it means that the, the main time of lighting is sunset, but if one wants to light earlier, one is permitted to do so. So we see two, we see two opinions that one has to light all right only at night, or one can light earlier than that. So it has to be at a time that he will see it. So the Shulchan Aro takes this, takes this argument and says, one should not light, light Hanukkah candles before the sunset, but rather at the end of sunset, i.e. nightfall. One must not light later, but later or before that. So pretty clear, rolling just like Tosafot. Nabura has his comment. But in truth, many are shown hold that the intention of the Gemara is for the beginning of the second sunset, which is approximately a quarter of an hour. See the Bir Halacha, which we explain that those who have a custom of reciting to recite Mariv at the proper time after nightfall it is proper to light candles beforehand. And this is also the rule ruling the more uksa. Uh, and this was the custom of the Gra. Uh, but one must put enough oil in the last for half an hour after nightfall. So we see a few things here. The first is the idea of two sunsets that we are not gonna discuss at this time, but there is an opinion that many Rishonim and Achronim believed that there was two different times that were called sunset. And this is why we have a thing called the Rebbeinu Tom for what time Shabbat ends. It deals with some technical Gemaras. We will hopefully go into that at some point, unfortunately, Sorba itself, the book that I use, hasn't even published about Shabbat yet. But the other thing to note here is the idea of having enough oil in to last into the night. So even if one lit earlier, which is the opinion of Maruksa, the Maruksa and the Gra, the Vilnagon, still one has to have enough oil to last into the night. That is and we'll see further in the Mishnah Bureau. If one has not yet lit and nightfall arrives, one should first daven Mari, for this is more frequent and the more frequent mitzvah usually is performed first. And it also contains the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema, which is from the Torah. But you should know that even those who have the custom to light after Mari should at least prepare the oil and the candles before Mari in order to be ready to light immediately after Mari. Since if one does all the preparation after Mari, one must certainly be concerned that the main time for lighting will be elapsed which would be the first half hour after the nightfall, according to the strict rule of the Gemara. So the, the Gemara, or the Mishnah Bureau states that, the, that we can actually light later time. One should be careful to, be, to light in that first half hour, according to the simple understanding, or what I'm calling, I will call the way Tosva understands the Gemara. So that's all for the earliest time. But what about the latest time? Sounds from the Gemara that the latest time is where when people is when people stop going through the marketplace. So let's look again at this Gemara a little bit more in full. The mitzvah of, of kindling the Hanukkah light is from sunset until traffic in the market ceases. Does that not mean that if the light is extinguished, he must rekindle it so that it will remain lit for the duration of this period? The Gemara answers, no, the Brita can be understood otherwise, that if one did not yet light at sunset, he may still light the Hanukkah light until traffic ceases. Alternatively, one could say that this is referring to a matter of measure, for one must prepare a wick and oil sufficient to burn for the period lasting from sunset until traffic ceases. If he did so, even if, he would, even if the light is extinguished beforehand, he need not relight it. So there are two different ways of understanding this one more stringent than the other, that we are dealing with 
either the time, uh, either that one must light it so that it lasts for a set amount of time. It can it just has to be set to last for that amount of time, but it doesn't actually have to last for that amount of time. So the halacha as brought down by the Shulchan Aruch is if one did not light at sunset, either due to forgetfulness or intentionally, one may still light until people stop passing through the marketplace, which is approximately half an hour, because that, then the people are going and returning, and thus the miracle is publicized. Therefore, one must place enough oil for the time, and if one put, put more oil in, one may extinguish the candle after the time has passed, and may use the light after this, that time. And this is the ideal case. But if this time has passed, and one is not lit, one may continue to light all night. And if the entire night passes, and one is not lit, there is no rectification for this. So the Shulchan Aruch seems to go a step beyond what we see in the Gemara, and says that we should ideally last for that, per that period of half an hour. The pa time passes where people stop going through the street. Still, one is able to light all the way until sunrise. But once the, once the sun is rid risen, then, then there is no lighting after that point. So that was the opinion of the Shulchan Aruch. We look at the opinion of the Ramah, who says that in the lands of Ashkenaz, there are those who say that nowadays when people light indoors, there is no need to be careful to light before people stop passing through the marketplace. But nevertheless, it's good to be careful even nowadays. So we see the Ramah staying consistent with his opinion that one can light inside and the idea of publicizing the miracle is less about for people outside and more for people inside. That, that is still, primarily for when we lit to publicize that is of time is primarily for when we're publicizing to the outside world. But when we're publicizing only to our household, then we just need to make sure to be careful to light at a time when the household is awake, as long as it's before sunrise. But still he says it is better to be careful. The last idea I want to share is the idea of lighting from earlier than sunset. There are quite a few different time periods, one of which is called Plagamincha, which is really the halfway point between, between midday and sunset. And Plagamincha tends to be a period that we consider as if it is the beginning of Sunset. Um, so the first opinion that we see is the opinion of the Rambam, who says, very straightforward, one may not light Hanukkah candles before sunset, but rather at sunset. No mincing words about it, but Pagamincha is not allowed, one has to light at sunset. It's taken by the Bika Yosef, the collection of that were put out in the commentary to the Beit Yosef, the works of Rabbi Yosef Cairo. And he says, since from the beginning, the stage is instituted eight days, then invariably this includes Shabbat. This is how they originally enacted the decree, that on Arab Shabbat, one lights when it is possible to light before sunset. But during the week, one must light once the sun sets. And this prevents fulfillment of the mitzvah if not followed. So very straightforward that no, no two ways to understand it. He says, the Rambam, the Rambam says, can't light before sunset, except for on Shabbat, which was a special, which was special for the, specially established for lighting before. So that was his commentary in the Beer Yosef. In the Beit Yosef, however, he says, is written in the name of Rabbi Yitzhak Abu Hub, that it states in the uh, that states in the or Chaim that one who lit while it was still day even during the week. Um, 
even though it waits because he was occupied, has fulfilled his obligation, provided that it was from the latter, latter Pogham and Howard. For it is not more stringent than Abdullah, about which it states uh, that Ralph prayed the prayer of Moti Shabbat on Shabbat. Yet one must put, put in more oil than usual in order that it burns until the last person in the marketplace leaves. So the Beit Yosef here says, contrary to what you th we saw in uh, the Birkei Yosef, that, the, that one may light for already from half, halfway in the afternoon, as long as there's enough oil to burn until, until after it becomes dark. And this is brought down in the Shulchan Aruch. There is the opinion that states that if one is busy, one may light earlier from Plaza Mincha onward on condition that one puts enough oil to burn until the last person leaves the marketplace. And on this, we see that there is going to be, uh, right? And one may recite the bracha as well. So there's always going to be a question of whether or not one can recite a blessing on something that's done in a way that's not ideal. And the Mishnah Brewer here says that there is no problem to, to say the bracha. Um, and the last thing to see is this response of the Shevet Um So this is going to be the modern understanding of how this applies to us nowadays. So that what you asked regarding lighting Hanukkah candles for someone who was returning home late at night, what should he do? Should one light from Plaza Mincha or light when he returns at a late hour? Or should, or should he light at the time for lighting by appointing point, an agent? In any case, the possibility of lighting from Plaza Mincha and onward, even in time when of need, is not so simple. And it is obvious to me that one who can light at the proper time using an agent for, for himself from Plaza Mincha should light using an agent. As in this manner, he definitely has fulfilled the mitzvah. While on the other, there is doubt as to whether he has fulfilled the mitzvah, his obligation. But as for the second uncertainty, as to whether the lighting, uh, light using an agent at the correct time or oneself at late at night, this seems to be an issue that the Gaon of the Gaon the Chatan Sofer was unsure about in Ishar Hato Tafot, chapter 11, regarding whether the notion of performing mitzvah early via an agent is preferred over the principle that is a greater method when performed by oneself than through an emissary. Nevertheless, it seems that the general approach in the Gemara leans more towards saying that one should delight later oneself as long as one can still say, say the bracha, I, if others are still around who will see it. So the, the Shevet Levi says that there is an idea in, all, in most mitzvot of having a shaliyah, an agent, to perform the mitzvah for you. And when the idea is, when there is a disagreement or there is an option between doing something in a non-ideal manner and doing something in an ideal manner through an agent, one should do it in the ideal manner through an agent. So where Plag HaMincha, the Rambam was very explicit that it did not work, even though the Shulchan Aruch himself doesn't rule like that, Rule like that. We see, we see that in that case, the Shevet Levi says one should use an agent. But late at night, where even though it's not ideal, it is still done in the correct manner, then the Shevet Levi seems to think that it is better that one should do it themselves than through an agent, as long as they're going to be able to do it properly. The idea of saying a bracha again is going to be a little bit complicated. That is something that wasn't really mentioned in anything here, but to give it in brief, the idea of a bracha has to be connected with the idea of publicizing the miracle. So one is not allowed to say the bracha if there is nobody else awake in the house to publicize the miracle for. So that is this idea of if others are still around who will see it. With that being said, that is the whole of, that is the whole of the halakhas of Hanukkah. There is a summary here of all of the different opinions that that we saw um, of the places the places that they should be lit and the and the time. Um, before we go, is there any questions on this?
right? If not, it was a pleasure to learn with you as always. And I hope you have a wonderful night. I am giving you now those five minutes to try and get yourselves together if you plan on going to Rabbi Rosenblatt here so that you have some time between cheering. Thank you so much for learning with me and I look forward to, to learning with you again next week. Have a good night. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Good night.